Welcome to Words to Live By, a podcast series hosted by the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. Each week, we will share some of the wit and wisdom of Ronald Reagan. In essence, words to live by. And the content is made up of radio addresses and speeches he delivered from the 1960s through the 1980s. From 1975 to 1979, Ronald Reagan delivered more than 1,000 daily radio broadcasts, most of which he wrote himself. At the time of these addresses, Ronald Reagan held no political office, yet he wanted a way to stay in touch with the American people. By listening to these addresses, you can hear how he was mapping out a strategy to transform the economy, to end the Cold War, and to create a vision of America that would propel him to the presidency. In this radio address, entitled Our Country, Ronald Reagan discusses how, although he can disagree with government practices, he doesn't disagree with the overall system of America's government, which he calls unique in all the world. I have disagreed with those in government on many of these broadcasts. I'm sure I'll continue to do so. But just to keep the record straight, let me make plain my criticism is not directed against this system of ours, which is unique in all the world. I thought of this the other day when I read an account of a meeting to launch an Australian visitor here on a three-month tour of campus appearances. The visitor, Wilfred Burchett, is hardly a typical representative of the land down under. He has been identified as a collaborator with our enemies in two wars, Korea and North Vietnam. He is telling our college students what is wrong with America, and his message is not just a complaint about bureaucratic ineptness. According to him, our system is the enemy of mankind, and those who believe in it are the dragons who must be slain before we devour all that is good and noble in the world. More from President Reagan's address after this message. The Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation is the nonprofit organization created by President Reagan himself and specifically charged by him with continuing his legacy and sharing his principles, individual liberty, economic opportunity, global democracy, and national pride. We must remain vigilant and work together to share these conservative principles with younger generations. Your role is critical to move our mission forward. Thank you for your continued support. Please visit reaganfoundation.org slash give. That's reaganfoundation.org slash give. Now, back to President Reagan. Well, I offer in rebuttal the words spoken a few years ago when we were still involved in the Vietnam War by a widely known and respected Canadian commentator who became angry at the rest of the world for, as he put it, kicking us when we were down. God bless him. Gordon Sinclair went on the radio and said, It is time to speak up for the Americans as the most generous and possibly the least appreciated people in all the earth. He said, as long as 60 years ago, when I first started to read newspapers, I read of floods on the Yellow River and the Yangtze. Who rushed in with men and money to help? The Americans did. Germany, Japan, and even to a lesser extent Britain and Italy were literally lifted out of the debris of war by the Americans who poured in billions of dollars in aid and forgave other billions in debts. When the franc looked to be in danger of collapsing in 1956, it was the Americans again who propped it up. I hope we'll keep right on being the first to arrive when help is needed. Once president, Ronald Reagan started doing Saturday radio addresses from the White House beginning in April of 1982. It's when he would informally address the nation on current events. Not since Franklin Roosevelt's fireside chats had an incumbent president spoken to his constituents over the radio. As Ronald Reagan wrote in his autobiography in American Life, By going on television or radio and telling people what was going on and what we were trying to do about it, I thought I might be able to get public opinion on my side. It worked better than I ever dreamed it would. Thank you for listening. For more information on the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute, including information on how to become a member, information on upcoming exhibits at the Reagan Library, or more information on the legacy of President Reagan, please visit reaganfoundation.org. And don't forget to like and follow the Reagan Foundation on all social media platforms. 
Until next week, thanks for listening, and God bless you. Now, it's possible to listen to podcasts produced by our Reagan Forums with politicians, authors, members of the media, business leaders, and military leaders. In fact, here's a sample. The stories Mark shared at the Reagan Library on March 6, 2018, offered a rare glimpse in what life was like when the Reagans were at their best, unscripted and unburdened by the world, without a camera in sight. You know, the thank you, Joanne. You know, the funny thing about that, that Rockney movie is how little Ronald Reagan was actually in it and how impactful it was. I, I forgot all about that. Joanne wasn't being honest with you. I don't have a large group of friends. So, um, well, thank you, Joanne, and thank all of you. It's a treat to see all of you. Before I begin, I, tell the truth by a show of hands. How many of you are here to see if I really do have a wife and children. <laughs> well, I do, and they're here. Now, stand up, let everybody see you. Come on. <laughs> Take a good look. They're due back at the Warner Brothers prop department by 10. <laughs> a reading from a book by Mark. Praised be to Simon Schuster. Okay, here we go. As pretty much everyone here knows, speaking from the podium is not my comfort zone. It's not what I'm most experienced in. I was the guy who made sure the podium was where it was supposed to be, then retreated to the back of the room with the press corps, or maybe to backstage with the staff. That was my comfort zone. So I apologize if I am something less than a great communicator but I'll try. Before I begin, I would be remiss if I did not mention that today is two years exactly since Mrs. Reagan joined her husband. Would you join me in a moment of silence in her memory, please? Thank you. It is so special to be here at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library and Museum as you know, he loved this place. They both did, and I thank you, Joanne, for inviting me. Presumably, everyone here knows how to read. Well, most everyone, so I will not do a reading per se. Rather, what I thought I would do is spend a few minutes telling you about my book, why I wrote it, and what I hope some of the takeaways are, and then open this up for Q&A. I cannot imagine anything more dreadful than having to sit and listen to me drone on and on. <laughs> Ask my wife and kids. And as many people in this room know, Ronald Reagan always said, it is better to have a dialogue than a monologue. So if that's okay with you, we'll do that. Now, I never intended to write a book about my time with the Reagans. Not that I did not cherish it, but First of all, I'm a little bit lazy, and secondly, I didn't think I had a story to tell. But as time went on, and book after book, many excellent ones were written about the President and Mrs. Reagan, it occurred to me that a pic piece of the picture was missing. No one was writing about what I thought was a very unique story, and an important story, an important aspect of their lives together how they were in private at Camp David, and the movies they watched there. Now, it was my wife, Erin, who urged me to do this and to share that part of the Reagan legacy, and she pointed out two things. One, it was a story only I could tell. And two, it was the only story I could tell. <laughs> because I am not a policy person. I could not write a story about arms control or economic revitalization or rebuilding of the military. That's not where I was. But I had a unique vantage point and relationship over many years. And this time, Aaron was right. So I set out to share with everyone what the Reagans were like in private. Some in this room 
shared that experience at their most relaxed at Camp David in a modest home with very few aides, no press, no ceremony, just them as they did what they enjoyed most, watching movies in their living room there. Not surprising when you consider that they were both former movie stars and proud veterans of Hollywood. It was there that they met, began their lives together, and learned things that would help them be, in my humble opinion, the most successful and beloved first couple in modern history. To his credit, Ronald Reagan never shied away from having been an actor. He was proud of that. Now, some of us stuffed shirts on the staff were not as convinced, but he respected the movie business and even went so far as to say he did not see how anyone could succeed as president without having been an actor. <laughs> yeah, fine moment. I need not tell this gathering how some in the press used that against him. So one day I asked him what he meant by that. And he very articulately explained that in a television era, it was necessary to learn how to communicate with large audiences, how a gesture, a reaction, an expression could convey a message sometimes more effectively than the words you spoke. And he understood and mastered the technical demands of the modern day presidency, sound, lighting, and staging. And that made it very pleasant for people like me when we were working and there would be photo ops when we would say, sir, we have to wait for a moment while the photographer adjusts his lens or adjusts the lighting. And he would almost immediately launch into a story about how something similar had happened in his previous profession, was never impatient, was never irritated, and allowed professionals to do their jobs. As my kids would say, he totally got it. So I set out on this book to take readers behind the scenes at Camp David, literally into the living room of the Reagans as they watched and for the most part enjoyed so many iconic movies of the 1980s, like Top Gun, Back to the Future, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, On Golden Pond, Ghostbusters, Rocky IV, Oh God, Book Two, The Shape of War, no wait, War Games. <laughs> among many others, and some of what the president called golden oldies, one of which we just saw. And I endeavored to share what they thought, how the movie may have impacted things, and how they related to what was going on in the country and in the Reagans' lives at the time. And I share some perspectives from the, a vantage point of an admittedly naive and stupid 20-something-year-old in a remarkable job and how this truly wonderful couple was so warm, welcoming, and exemplary. Don't forget to subscribe to the Words to Live By podcast in your iTunes or Google Play stores and on other podcast platforms as they become available. New episodes of Words to Live By come out every Tuesday. Like what you hear? Check out our A Reagan Forum podcast, featuring great speeches delivered at the Reagan Library. New episodes drop every Thursday. And don't forget to follow at Ronald Reagan on Facebook, at Ronald Reagan 40 on Twitter, and Reagan Foundation on YouTube. Also, search for us on SoundCloud and Stitcher. <laughs>